Good afternoon. Good afternoon on behalf of the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, INTAC, I am delighted to welcome the August gathering to today's lecture. The lecture will explore the multicultural worlds in the Indian court paintings. Ladies and gentlemen, however, as is customary, I will not follow the customary pattern because the illustrated lecture will unfold in front of you shortly. So I will not introduce the topic even though I have my blurb and my script ready. Instead, I'd like to take that time to introduce uh, our very, very special speaker today, Dr. Vishakha N. Desai. Vishakha ji, namaskar. And it is my absolute pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you on behalf of the entire Intact family. Dr. Desai has been at Columbia University in various capacities, including Senior Advisor for Global Affairs to the President, Chair of the Committee on Global Thought, and Senior Research Scholar in Global Studies at its School of International and Public Affairs. Prior to joining Columbia in 2013, Dr. Desai served as President and CEO of Asia Society for eight years and Senior Vice President and Director of uh, the museum since 1990. In 2012, in recognition of Dr. Desai's leadership in the museum field, President Barack Obama appointed her to serve on the National Museums and Library Services Board. Her professional career spanning the last four decades includes positions at the Cleveland Museum Brooklyn Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Along with her scholarship on pre-modern art, she is well known for organizing groundbreaking exhibitions of Asian and Asian American art in the US. She has published several major art catalogs and has lectured extensively on the intersex intersection of traditional and contemporary arts in diverse countries of Asia. Her most recent publication, World as Family, A Journey of Multi-Rooted Belongings, Columbia University Press 2021, received the Nautilus Book Award for Memoir in 2022. A recipient of five honorary degrees, Dr. Desai holds a BA in Political Science from Bombay University's Bombay University, I beg your pardon, and an MA and PhD in Asian Art History from the University of Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, please do put your phones on silent. And now, Vishakha ji, I formally invite you on stage to begin the lecture. Thank you, Manisha ji, for a uh, more than lengthy uh, introduction, but I appreciate that. And thank you all for coming. I know given the weather and the pollution that you've braved, I appreciate that you didn't stay home to stream, live stream, although those of you who are live streaming it, I, I hope that you enjoy the lecture as well. Um, I, I must say this idea of doing a talk here has been in the gestation period for quite some time. And it was prior to COVID and then COVID happened and we were trying to figure out the, la uh, the appropriate time for me to be here. So I'm just delighted to be here. But I should also say that I'm no stranger to Delhi and, uh, but I haven't been here for three, four years. So some of you friends who are also streaming said, gee, this is an interesting topic. 
I'm really interested in what you're going to say. And how did you come to that? So let me just say a word about the genesis of this topic. Even though I have lived with Indian painting, that's part of my PhD dissertation, for more than four decades, I've worked with the Indian miniature painting, court painting tradition. Um, the way I'm thinking about it now is a bit different from before. So the reason why this topic of multicultural world came about had to do with actually the book that Manisha mentioned, uh, the memoir that I wrote called The World as Family, of course, inspired by Vasudeva Kutumbakam, based on my students at Columbia who actually said, I want to figure out how can you be globally connected and passionate about the world without alienating yourself and your roots at the local level. And out of that emerged my journey of saying, gee, how did I get to be so passionate about being locally rooted and globally connected. What is that? And it was very clear that it had a lot to do with my Indian background, but particularly this phrase, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And the phrase today is seen everywhere. It was at the UN when I did the, did the speech at the UN conference on the topic. Everywhere in India right now because of G20, it is around us. So one could say that it's a pretty easy thing to say. But the concept of to treating the world as family is profound, if you think about that. And that many world religions talk about the world being one. But nobody has actually thought about comparing the world with family. And that, I believe, is a unique contribution that India makes. But for me, it was also the full phrase from which this phrase comes, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that was of interest to me. So let me just read that full phrase to you, which graces the entrance of the Indian parliament right here in Delhi. And the phrase comes from Maha Upanishad, uh, volume 6, 71 to 73 text, dating from about 1,000 years before Christ. So you're already talking about more than 3,000 years old. And it goes like this. Ayam nijaha paroviti ganana lagu chetasam udara charitanam tu vasudeva kutumbakam. So the first part of that whole phrase is as important as the second part. The first part says, those who are of the small-minded nature think one is a relative, the other a stranger. If you were to say it in a common parlance, it would be that those of a limited mind think only the blood relatives are their family. But those of magnanimous nature, or udar charitanam, know to treat the world as family. So, in fact, our forefathers, unfortunately they were all fathers because that's how they wrote, um, but in the Vedic tradition and in Maha Upanishad, they were pretty clear that in order to understand how to treat the world as family, what you have to do is to go beyond treating your limited number of relatives as your family. The other thing they understood was that the concept of world belonging is too abstract. If you actually compare the world to your family, what do you learn in a family? And I always say in the American context that in the functional family at least, you learn that you have to learn about yourself in the context of others. You have to learn about being independent in the context of interdependence. And when that family is not functional, it is actually broken at home, and you can't go beyond that. So that very idea is something that I thought, you know, for millennia, travelers have come from all over the world to India. One thing they always comment on is that how this polyglot nation works. How is it that people from many different communities, castes, hundreds of different ideas, different religions, 
how is it that this culture seems to manage it? It is written as early as in the first century BCE, as it was written by 18th century travelers to India. And so then I said, hmm, what if one looked at paintings to say, how does this manifest itself? Where does it manifest? And how does it work? So this particular talk is actually to try to look at within the 16th to the 19th century, or actually starting in the 15th century, prior to the Mughal period, um, what are the ways that different communities accommodate each other? What are the ways that they take things from each other and maintain their individual identity? How are things syncretically connected but also remain independent. This is something that I believe is a unique nature of the subcontinent, especially of the Indic culture. And so this is what I am going to share with you as a conversation. And I should say that this is the beginning of a conversation. It's a topic that actually at Columbia, we are very interested in developing it into a much bigger project to look at it from various perspectives. And so what I share with you are my preliminary thoughts, but these are paintings that I've lived with for more than four decades in terms of as an art historian, as a scholar, and as a curator. And so it's been kind of interesting for me as I prepared for this talk to look at these paintings and look at them anew with fresh pair of eyes. So what I will do is to look at both the movement of ideas, cultural conventions, movement of artists and artistic practices among different communities and courts in northern India primarily, with some reference to the Deccan, between the Mughal and Rajput courts, but also with some connection to Jain and uh, Deccani traditions. So with that, uh, let me take you on a journey. So we begin with the late 15th century, 1475, and some of the earliest of the kind of miniature tradition, as we call it, that comes out of the Jain tradition. And you might say this looks very typically Jain manuscript, small, uh, horizontal, initially out of palm leaf, then onto the paper. But what is unique about this, this is in, done in Ahmedabad, and it also remains in Ahmedabad today. And I'm proud to say, because I'm from Ahmedabad, so I have to begin with Ahmedabad, right? You know, a little bit of a push for the one's origin, as it were. Um, what is unique about this is the presence of blue. That idea of lapis that begins to show up in the Western, in the Western Indian painting tradition only is possible because of the Persian lapis that comes into Gujarat from other parts of West Asia. And out of that, it becomes now a prominent thing. So this is as much about world coming to India and India adopting what comes, as it is also how the presence of Shahi kingdoms and the various Muslim shahs begins to be part of the story that gets incorporated in the Jain manuscript. This is actually the manuscript of Kalaka Charya Katha, and this is the story of Kalaka, the Jain priest who sees on the, let's see, over on that side, um, where he goes to a Shah, a Muslim ruler, because he wants the help of this Muslim ruler, and through the magic, he convinces him that he should help the Jain priest whose sister, was abducted by the king of Ujjain, and it is to overthrow the king of Ujjain. So you're beginning to see this presence and how you would accommodate, adjust, use each other, whatever you need to do, that begins to show up within the manuscript tradition. And so in the pre-Mughal world, there is already this connection of how these two communities are coming together, and multiple communities coming together. This is particularly true in both Malwa, this is a picture of Nimat Nama, very famous, uh, dating from about 1502, 1503, um, and it's a sultanate picture. 
that um, is actually the, uh, from a manuscript of Food of Delicacies. Now, this is the painting very well known. We've all known about that for a long time. What is really interesting about this is that it takes its idea from the Shirazi style manuscript from Iran, but actually, it is, and it's written in the Nasalik, you see that here, but it's also written actually in the old fashioned world of uh, the Prakrit. And all of the names of the dishes are in Prakrit that people can read about. And if you see the picture itself, you will see that there's very clearly a demarcation, but the combination of Indian women wearing Indic clothes, Persian people who are also there. So this kind of an idea of a kitchen where the ruler is tasting the delicacies with the combination of various groups of people coming together and uh, practicing making of food and serving of food. What's interesting about this also is that there are many, many things in the dishes that come out looking much more Indian than they are Persian in nature. And this is another thing that you learn in the Sultanate world, that things are already beginning to come together. And I want to emphasize that this is not to say that uh, there hadn't been fights. It is not to say that there are not actually other kinds of uh, tensions that occur, but there is also a method of accommodation and adjustments, and that's what we want to, in a way, look at today. The, this is also true of the manuscripts that come up also in the pre-Mughal tradition, and these are the sets of manuscripts, illustrated manuscripts called Laura Chanda, or this is a story of uh, Laura and Chanda, a love affair between the two people, and Chandayana is sometimes what it's called. It's actually written by an Indian Muslim, Maulana Daud Dolman, in 1389, and it is written initially in Avadi, but it also is translated in Nastalik. And there are many different copies of this particular manuscript that are done all over India as early as in the 14th and 15th century. So you have a translation of Lord Chanda in Bihari, in Punjabi, in uh, Prakrit. So you actually, depending on the different regions, all regional languages have this translated, and it always has some Nastalik with it. So this idea of multiple languages for one script is also very present in Sultanate India or in the pre-Mughal India that one should um, think about. And the story is also more like a love affair because actually uh, Chanda is not his wife and then his wife uh, gets mad and there are fights between the two of them and so forth and so on. So it has to do with sort of the lady who is the other Naika tradition that also has a relationship to this even though it's written by actually a Muslim writer in um, Avad. And this is where actually uh, Lorak finds Chanda in, in sitting under the tree. And this particular manuscript is actually in Prince of Wales Museum, or rather Chhatrapati Shivaji. You can tell I'm old, you know. I forget the new names. But anyway, that it's, it's, it's in Mumbai collection. While this also is true in certain sultanate areas, that particular manuscript was thought to have come from um, in fact, from perhaps Jaunpur, now people feel that it could come from anywhere in northern part of India. Another big center, of course, in the 15th century and in the early 16th century is Ahmedabad. And this particular manuscript is the translation, one of the earlier translations of Upanishad that was done in the 15th century that now is in the library in Ahmedabad. And so this is the time when you also realize that people like Muhammad Begra in Ahmedabad had a court poet, and that court poet were, had written Raj Vilas, and his name was um, Uday Raj. And Uday Raj wrote not only about Muhammad Begra's tradition, but also other cultural histories that were part of that period. So that by the time we come to 
Akbar, and this is something we have read about a lot, we have talked about it. We know that in Fatehpur Sikri, the whole idea of inviting people of different religions, different cultures, and different traditions for Akbar to understand them is a fairly well-known thing. But when you see a document like this, and this is actually the document where you see that the central point of discussion is one of the longish scroll that you see right in the middle part of the painting. And then you have the Jesuit priest on the one side. You have the Hindu priest who is right uh, next to, sitting next to Akbar. And then you have also other Persian scholars who are all around them. So this is actually the time of discussion of various different manuscripts. And this was something that is very well illustrated in a painting like this. This comes from the Akbar Nama, dating from about 1605 or so. Uh, it's a picture that is well known. It's in the Chester Beatty Library. But what is interesting to me as I look at it now is that how the idea of different manuscripts, different formats, are shown as much as different kinds of people in terms of the clothing. And then you have this amazing man, uh, piece that also comes from one of the manuscripts, this particular painting is in the Freer Library in Philadelphia, where it actually is the process by which the Mahabharata was written and translated at the Mughal court. So what you see down below is different, and it's actually described when this particular manuscript was getting put together. And that is that many different groups of scholars of Mahabharat had come together. Oral recitation was as important as written text. They would discuss it down below, and then they would come together and then it would be the translation that was being done by the Persian script scholars of Indian origin, seated on the sides up top, who are then trying to understand from the Hindu priests and religious figures as to what that language is going to be. And therefore, the Mahabharat would be actually authentic, but it would be connected among different versions that were known in India at the time, and then the new translation emerges that was also true of the Ramayana. And this was done not just by Akbar, but also a number of other courtiers, such as Kani Kanan, that we all, uh, that very well known. And so that when you see the painting, this is actually from one of the uh, what we call the sub-imperial Ramayana tradition, which is in the Freer uh, Sackler Gallery at, in, in Washington, the National Museum of Asian Art. And it was, in fact, the manuscript that was commissioned by Kani Kanan that you see right here. And all of these are styles that now are emerging. And I haven't talked much about style, which we'll go into it a little bit later. But you can see the mountains up top actually come out of the Persianate style that originated with the mountains in China. And then you have the figures that are coming very much out of the Indian tradition. But the, when you see the elephant coming down, that reminds you very much of the other kind of elephant fights that would be happening in a Mughal court painting. So you begin to see combinations of styles that are coming from different places, ideas that are coming from different places, and now becoming something that actually one can say is very Indian rather than of any one particular tradition. And that comes through extremely well, I think, when you see this wonderful picture of Hari Vamsha illustrated page that is in the Metropolitan Museum. And you see, obviously, it's the Krishna lifting Mount Govardhana. But that Mount Govardhana looks so much like coming out of the Iranian painting tradition that actually, as I said, is an influence from other parts of um, East Asia. And then if you see underneath, there are all kinds of people actually protected under Krishna, not just simply of one type, but there are some bearded figures that come out of the Muslim origin. There are other figures that are there, men, women, all together. So it's almost like Krishna is a protector of everybody.
on this earth, on this subcontinent. And that is the tradition that then gets developed as kind of a classic Mughal style that also has connections to other parts of Rajasthan and central India. It's also true that as was I suggested that in the pre-Mughal period, there was already this connection going back and forth about understanding culture, learning about literature, translations of texts. This is also true at the Deccani court. So this particular page of a Ragamala that is from the Adil Shai court at Bikaner, I mean uh, Bijapur. And what you see here and find out is that Adil Shah was lover of Indian music very interested in the Ragamala paintings, and he actually had a number of Ragamala texts translated Persian as well as in um, Sanskrit, as well as in Hindi, and then commissioned that because he was particularly interested in the classification of Ragamala. So this particular painting of Asantaraga has both the Persian script up top, along with the Sanskrit down below, very different Ragamala <coughs> a text than what you might see in northern India because it's unique to the Deccan. And that kind of idea of people's interest in different cultures, different ideas, is very, very clear in terms of the presence of Christian imagery that comes to the Mughal court, especially um, in Akbar's period in the 16th century into the early 17th century. So very well known images of Madonna and child that often came from both Italianate and Dutch paintings or Northern Landish paintings in India starting into the 16th century. Uh, and you can see that very well here. And I'm particularly fond of this picture that is Madonna and child, child, Christ child, along with the two figures. But you would not mistake it for anything but an Indian figure. And you can see that in terms of while the robes and the fabric at the back has obviously uh, suggestions of things coming from the Northern Renaissance and Italian Renaissance pictures, but the face of the lady, the jewelry, that the attendant wears along with the uh, Madonna, you can see that, that all of that becomes very Indianized. And this is something that Abu Fazal, the court historian for Akbar, talks a lot about, is that how artists at the Mughal court would take ideas from many, many different traditions, but they would create something that even when the Westerners or Sir Thomas Rowe would look at it and he would not be able to recognize whether it was from somewhere else or was a Mughal court because their eyes were so good. The truth is, when we look at it now, we say, oh, this is actually very Indian. It isn't so much uh, coming out of the Italian tradition, but it has to do with accommodation, adjustments, interest, and curiosity, and remaining open. And that becomes very clear even when you see in this Darbar of Jahangir, and this is dating from about 16, 15 or so. And if you look carefully, you'll see up top, above Jahangir, in the corner, is actually a picture of Madonna that we know was actually at the court because he was interested in that. You can also see down below that there is a Jesuit figure right underneath there. And when I first started to look at this picture, this is in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston where I was. This is um, Jangir San Parvez, who is actually um, born of one of the Hindu princesses who got uh, married to uh, Jahangir, and then before that to Akbar as well. But here, the Jesuit figure is there, but of course his placement, which is interesting, is that he's right next to the head of stables, elephant stables. Not so important as other Hindu and Muslim figures that are up top as courtiers. So that um, it, it's important that he is there, but he's not so important that he can take away from other cultural diversity that is shown up at the top. Um, there's a lot to say about this picture politically in terms of what was happening at the time, because Parvez come, but it's this time 
Shah Jahan, who is standing right next to Jahangir, um, already is the favored son. And so this is the last time Parvez is shown in any favorable position, and then it ends at that moment. But this is, um, so now I want to just talk a little bit about the pictures that show birth scenes in the Mughal court. So this is the birth of Murad, one of the sons of Jahangir, and it also comes from, um, no, this comes from, from Akbar Nama, and it's one of the sons of Akbar, rather, not, not Jahangir. And you can see that when you look at this picture, you immediately recognize Aso Palav, you recognize the drumming, the festivities that are part of Indian tradition, even including the kind of a swing that you see down below. And then you see the uh, Persianate figures who are doing the horoscope. And this comes from the uh, Vienna Akbar Nama. So partly why this picture becomes interesting is that you have the combination of women of different types, but it becomes even more clear when you see the birth of Jahangir. And this is from Jahangir Nama, not from Akbar Nama. Akbar Nama is 1590. This is about 1605, 1612, uh, somewhere around there. And this shows the birth of Jahangir himself. And as you know, Jahangir was born of the Hindu wife of Akbar, meaning you also probably Akbar Jodha picture. Um, and so he, he is actually the son of not, I mean, Jodhabai was a wrong name, by the way, because she, um, her name, her original name was, let me get that name right so we don't forget that. And so she, her name was Harkabai. And the reason why she came known to be Jodabai is because there was another wife of the king of Jodhpur, and Todd made a mistake when he was writing the Chronicles, and then the name stuck. So we have to know that sometimes the history we know of ourselves is written by the Brit, and he made a mistake, and then we continued that mistake. So, uh, and then when she gives birth to Jahangir, and she's given a new name, called, and her name was uh, Miriam Zamani, Miriam Uzamani, and that was the compassionate one. And she was the favorite queen. And of course, by the way, um, there are many other Rajput rulers who then uh, married their daughters to Akbar and also to Jahangir, and that tradition of intermarriage and matrimonial alliances goes all the way through into the 19th century. Um, so that idea of the intermarriage for political reasons is something that was fairly common except for the court of Mewad. Almost everybody else actually was part of this. What was interesting to me about this picture, I've known this picture for a long time because, again, it was in the MFA collection <coughs> where I was a curator for a long time, that now what you begin to see is the horoscope chart is all being done by the lead is a Hindu priest, and then there are other Muslims who are looking at it. And after this time, we know from Jahangir Nama that all the correspondence about the astrological and astronomical things were now decidedly done by the Hindu priest because, in fact, the Mughal rulers had lots of faith in them. And this is what shows up, and it's also because of uh, uh, Harkabai's uh, connection, of course. And if you look at her zanana, you can see the combination, the person sitting next to her is actually Akbar's mother. And then you have both uh, eunuchs and Hindu and Muslim queen, uh, ladies in waiting all the way around. So the things that change, evolve, 
also can change again, but this is what you can see in this painting. And I think the details become much more clearer now. And that, um, we should also recognize that the festivals that were celebrated in India, uh, it is in the 15th and the 16th century, but especially at the Mughal court, where many festivals become part of the Mughal tradition as well. Holi was one of them. This is, uh, this is a painting from the Jahangir period, but also there is a painting of Jahangir that's very similar to this, also playing Holi. And this idea of uh, celebrating Holi, but also call actually, it sometimes was called Eid Gulabi, that it was almost like celebrating Eid, but now with pink. Um, was something that continued into the 18th century. And you can see that with this uh, painting of, uh, uh, from Avath and from uh, Murshidabad. And it kind of reminds you that uh, people like Amir Khusru, who was uh, a major 13th century and early 14th century poet here, is that he actually wrote wonderful little couplets about holy. And one of them goes something like this, I shall play holy and, uh, because a kwaja, it, uh, if I were to read it in Hindi, it would be, Ke lungi holi kaja ghar aaye, dhan dhan bhag hamare sajani, kaja aaye angane mere. So that I shall play holy as kaja is come home. Blessed is uh, forever, my uh, Lord, and then because the kaja has come home. And so that idea of saying that this was very much a part of both traditions becomes an important part of where um, such celebrations became part of Indic tradition. I, it's fair to say that one of the reasons why these things were possible is that it's because the Sufi tradition underlying the nature of practices in India made it possible for both people in the bhakti tradition and the Sufi tradition to come together. And that's a whole different topic, but it's something to remember that it's very prevalent in the 17th and the 18th century, with the exception in a brief period of time of Aurangzeb. And we will have a chance to talk about that too. I want to move now to not just cultural conventions, but also stylistic conventions that come together. And that, in as far as the uh, Akwari period is concerned, starting in the Hamzanama, the page that you see here, from the late 16th century, 1565, 1570, it's a kind of clothing people wear, the landscape that's developed. It feels a little bit like a pastiche. You see the kind of Indian temple idea in the back, but the mountains that come out of the Persian tradition, but the clothing that people wear here come much more out of the pre-Mughal Indic tradition. And this is what actually is the formation of Mughal painting. It's a combination of things that make the pictures as we now call Mughal painting. Um, but it also has connections to the kind of clothing that were worn by the figures in this kind of Bhagavad Purana pages that you see also from the late 16th century. But perhaps uh, the date is undetermined, but more or less earlier than the Hamza Nama page. And you also have the movement of artists. So on, in Mewad court, as I mentioned, that Mewad is the last kingdom to actually work with the Mughal kings. But they have presence of Muslim artists at the court long before that, as was true of Muslim musicians. So this particular set, 1628, as it is also true of 1605 Ragamala, this is Ragamala painting uh, from Shahibdin, and uh, the 1605, also by a Muslim artist, suggests that there is a presence of Muslim artists at Rajput courts long before uh, you have actually connections to the Mughal court. And it has to do partly with Ahmedabad, Gujarat, and Mewad and other places, uh, Malwa and other places. So that is something that these are, uh, Shahibdin was a court artist 
very important court artist who also was responsible for some of the major, major manuscripts such as Ramayana, also Rasikapiya, dating also around from the same time. That's also true in Bikaner. The court of Bikaner where the, this connection, the Bikaner court had much earlier connection with the Mughal court, and this is done by uh, Ruknuddin, very important artist in Bikaner court. Some people have suggested that he may have been a Mughal artist who then goes and travels to Bikaner, partly because Bikaner had strong matrimonial alliances with the Mughal court before um, Ruknuddin pictures come about. So this particular page is also from a Rasikapriya, and I'm obviously fond of these because my dissertation was in Rasikapriya, but it's interesting to look at different uh, modalities of these paintings as you uh, come across them. This is much more, much closer to the Mughal style than what you see in Mewad. And Ruknuddin is very well known at the paintings of women going to various kinds of fakirs, ascetic figures, um, a tradition that was both for Rajput rulers as well as for the Muslim rulers, uh, going to Ajmer, going to the uh, various Sufi saints. All of these are part of something that you see both in the Rajput tradition as well as in the Mughal tradition. And hunting scenes um, that come about, such as this one, dating from about the late 17th century, um, from Bikaner again, uh, directly related to some of the hunting scenes of women and princess and princely figures coming out of Rajasthan, Raj, uh, Mughal world. But what's interesting to me also is that if you look at this picture and you look at this, this Bikaner picture has much closer association with the Mughal court and related to Ruknuddin, Nuruddin, other artists who were there. And this painting, done at the Mewad court, of showing Shah Jahan's hunt in Mewad after the connection between the Mewad ruler and Shah Jahan is established. Um, and the artist choosing to not only make this picture into much more of a Mewadi idiom, and take away the Mughalized idea of soft tradition of painting, making the animals become much stronger, the faces of all of the people more generalized. All of these are styles that has to do with convention of Mewad. So it's a choice, as my colleague Molly Aitken has pointed out, is that the style is not just simply what is a convention. Style is also the way people choose to make something of their own. And that idea, of making something that comes from somewhere else, making your own, is part and parcel of accommodation, but also asserting your identity. And that comes through in when you see a painting like this. Um, this is a very interesting picture. It is a picture of the story of Yusuf and Zulaika, a very famous story, uh, comes out of Persia, was written by Saadi. And it was actually in an album, a Mughal painting that was in the album by the Jaipur court. Then the Jaipur ruler gives this album as a gift to the Mewad ruler as part of their political connection. And the painting, is paint, that album has painting from Mughal style as well as Jaipur style. What happens when it comes to Mewad is that actually Ari Singh decides that he wants that picture in his image. So Yusuf, this Persian story, now shows the Mewadi ruler as the divine one with a halo, with all the Christian emblems that you see up top. And the story goes something like this, again, like Lord Chanda. The story initially goes that, in fact, it is a Zuleika who is not his wife, which is Yusuf's wife, and he falls, because he's so beautiful, she falls in love with him. And then ultimately it's a story of she's dreaming that he's gonna to come to him, and this is the dream sequence. And so you can see the dream sequence of Bollywood. It has, you know, essences right there. We, we always like dream sequence. 
Um, and I think what, again, what's interesting here is that how things get adapted, what you add, what you distract, that becomes important. The next, quickly, because I'm running a little out of time, but it is the portraiture tradition. And as we all know, the idea of single portraits comes out of the Mughal court that actually Akbar starts. And it was not without controversy, as we know from Abul Fazal, because actually when he first started sitting for portraiture, Abul Fazal talks about how actually the Muslim clerics said this is not a good idea because only Allah is capable of showing the likeness of people, that you must not show the portrait. And actually, it was Akbar who said that it is very important that we are actually showing the portraiture to show the limitation of human beings, because you could never show it as perfect as what Allah would have created it, which was also his way of saying that we're going to do it anyway. And then he begins to show albums, and albums that are done for courtiers, courtiers who are Rajput Muslims, uh, Hindu Muslims, uh, as well as from other parts. Uh, we also have a wonderful uh, portrait of a Siddhi, uh, a, an African Hapsi, who is part of this album tradition. And you can see each one of them initially first a very simple, then a little bit more color, and then you begin to have more and more elaborate kind of way of showing these Rajput rulers. And then the paintings that are done in the Mughal court are often given to the Rajput rulers, and they begin to show portraits themselves, and they are given as a gift. So what you see here, this is actually a wonderful portrait, um, uh, Gaj Singh of Marwad. And it was, uh, Jodhpur was again very directly connected because Jodhpur rulers had given their daughters to Mughal rulers. And this particular picture we know was based on a Mughal portrait that then comes to Jodhpur and the Jodhpur artists actually create this based on that tracing. Um, it also is important to know that the matrimonial connection here was that actually a Marwadi princess was married to Jahangir, and it was her son who was Parvez. And so initially, Parvez was thought to be the heir apparent. But when that didn't happen, and Jahangir, uh, Shah Jahan, kills more or less Parvez, what happens is that then they're worried that this Gaj Singh, who might be very close to Parvez Shah Jahan, brings him to the court and makes sure that he is his trusted lieutenant. So Gaj Singh becomes quite important, and he's shown in a number of different Shahnama pages, such as this Shah Jahan on Peacock Throne. If you see the detail, there is Gaj Singh. And it is that kind of a portrait that then would have the tracing that the Jodhpur artist has created the other portrait. And this kind of an idea of where the portrait develops and where it goes has often a complex political history. So this is the portrait of Aurangzeb. And a portrait of Aurangzeb by none other than Ruknuddin, the Bikaner artist that I talked to you about. And it is about dated to 1687. In this is called, you know, and Ruknuddin is a Bikaneri artist, but this painting we know from the text is done in the Deccan. So, so what's he doing in the Deccan? It's because the Bikaner ruler has gone to Deccan on behalf of Aurangzeb to fight the Deccanese Sultan. The first ruler who goes there is Karan Singh. Now, Karan Singh has fought for Aurangzeb, but he is quite upset about Aurangzeb's anti-Hindu policies. So he becomes a rebel. What does Aurangzeb do? He actually goes ahead and creates a discord among his sons and privileges one of his sons who ends up back in the Deccan, and it is then when this portrait of Aurangzeb is done. 
So you have this history of, uh, we all have heard about Aurangzeb and his policies, but he is still continuing to play, and the Rajput rulers are also trying to figure out how to accommodate, what they're going to adjust. And this portrait actually gives you some of those uh, kinds of examples. And I want to jump now to the idea that the portraiture then begins to be a very important part of the Rajput tradition for a long, long time. So this particular painting is of Jaswan Singh, 1888, of Jodhpur. And we, you can see it. I don't have to say very much that how much this 1888 picture is really about the Victoriana, the presence of the British. And in fact, we know that Jodhpur and Kota were two places where the British had actually made very strong effort to create and provide political support along with defense support for those kings. And uh, this Jaswan Singh was very interested in photography. So this is actually based on a photograph that then is made into a painting. And he was interested enough in photograph that he also did the census of Jodhpur and what we should learn about, which is completely a British tradition. So the British presence is shown as much in the boots he wears, the tiles on the floor, the kind of accoutrement of the flowers and the little table. All of that has to do, and also not to forget the necklace that he wears, it's very Victorian. All of this is to say that it's possible for these kings to adapt the customs of whoever is going to come around. And yet, he was also known as very resistant to not having customs that were very British. So the idea is that you can take certain things, but you also resist other things. And that becomes a very important part of connecting to the outside world, but holding something of your own. And the last picture I want to show you is actually a painting um, that is from the Fraser album. And this particular album is, uh, the painting is by a master artist who worked for Fraser, who uh, shows the tax collectors and village elders. And this is about 1810 to 1820, probably Delhi or Haryana, right in this neighborhood. And why this picture is interesting to me is that uh, Fraser himself actually writes that uh, this is an assemblage of Zamindar in Kacheri with my Munshi and Diwan. The Munshi Fuzal Uzim of Kairadabad near Lucknow is a Musalman. Diwan Mohanlal of, Kais, of Delhi with spectacles on nose. So those are the two figures on the right-hand side. Um, um, and they are then at, followed by the attendees who are all headmen and elders of the villages. And so we know that actually this convention of different people coming together, working together, was something that was quite common as late as in 1810. And yet, it's fair to say that by the 19th century and early 20th century, that the colonial masters had perfected their divide and conquer policy. Division of Bengal on the basis of majority religions, as you know, in 1905, created one of the first ways when things are getting torn apart as far as the fabric of India was concerned. And that system of accommodation, adjustments, and the ability to work with diverse groups of people, something that was a true principle of a Sudeva Kutumbakam, actually practiced in India for a millennia, was now becoming fragile. And that divide and conquer policy is something that we might say, how do we get back to the spirit of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, not just abroad, but right here at our home? So I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation. I'm sure many of you have a lot to say, but it's a, it's a way to think about what is so special about the Indic civilization that has allowed for diversity of thought, ideas, and groups of people to come together. Thank you. Thank you, Vishakaji. We have about 10 minutes for a 
quick uh, question answer session. Uh, I would request all of you to keep your questions very brief and wait for the mic to reach you since we are streaming the event live. First question right there. Yeah, wait for the mic. What would you say about Aurangzeb's reputation as being less cosmopolitan than his ancestors? I think that it is true. I mean, as I was suggesting that Karan Singh got very upset, that you know he was working with him politically, but his policies were getting more orthodox. But to some extent, one might say that then it changes again by the time he's gone. So he's an exception rather than a rule. But it is true that that's what I was suggesting, that it's not like it's all always working out. There are times where also things are being conquered, people are killed, but it also is happening among kingdoms. So oftentimes, for example, Jodhpur Raja brings the Britishers in because he's wanting to protect himself from Bikaner. And that idea of political assign, uh, alignments are often for selfish interest. And sometimes it comes back to haunt you. But it is true that um, Aurangzeb was trying to hold, and he went away from both Jah Akbar Jahangir and Shah Jahan. But Shah Jahan already had those tendencies. And Shah Jahan was very autocratic. I mean, he killed his own siblings to come to power. So power becomes something that one has to deal with, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very nice, very in-depth presentation. My question is uh, why you abruptly ended at 1810, 1812, 20, uh, because after that, Sitaram and Majar Ali Khan, they were very phenomenal goat painters. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think that because I was realizing that I had 45 minutes and how to balance it, but that's why I brought the Fraser thing just to kind of remind us that up until the early 20th century, actually those things were there. But 1905 seemed to me like a good point to remind us that that was really the first time when very clearly Curzon says, this is what I'm doing. To divide, and that's why the nationalists in Bengal fight against it. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to you. Yeah. Thank you. That's really just impressive. Um, the, the paintings from the Sackler collection, really quite something. Um, just from your point of view, you know, we, we see such beautiful miniatures. They're all outside of India. What do you think for them to come back to India? What are your thoughts? Huh. And, and especially now with the British Museum getting into a lot of trouble because so much of the works that they have have been stolen and sold. So it would be lovely to just to get your views because you're an internationalist right. in the US. Yeah. And now you're you know, giving us this great talk in India. <laughs> so I'd love to hear that. Thank you. I think um, that's like a whole other topic, but big topic. And it's very vexed issue, especially. I mean, it's very interesting that the Indian government has never asked for paintings back compared to sculptures. One of the problems is that many of these paintings were sold by the royal families. And they came from these libraries. Some of them also had gone outside of India prior to even when the Britishers came. And much of this happened actually also later on, right around the time of independence, when the privy purses uh, were coming into play. And so if Maharajas were selling this, what are you going to do? And it becomes a problematic situation. So to some extent, I think the whole issue of restitution is a complex issue because one size doesn't fit all. And I'm, actually, I'm working on a big book that's a global book on intersection of politics and visual arts in the museums and in the contemporary art world uh, that'll come out, so stay tuned. There'll be lots of things to say, and it'll come out in 2020, late 24, early 25. 
Um, so I think paintings become more problematic than sculptures, because the sculptures that are actually part of temple complexes, that actually have been part of something, and they're taken off, even if they're sold. I mean, I think that's the other problem is that there are lots of middlemen who are selling stuff. And we can't only blame outsiders for that. The second thing, and I will add, and that's debatable, but I will say that I think that there, there are certain countries, and I have a colleague in Mexico who has talked about heritage diplomacy. And she mentions that actually sometimes having our work outside is one of the ways that people get to know about our cultures. And that that also should be considered because art has a unique capacity that it's a product of a place and time and it transcends place and time. It can connect, that's true of music, it's true of visual arts, and it can connect to people elsewhere. So just to give you a short example, when I first started in the museum world, it was as a classical Indian dancer. And I was a 21 year old, and I worked with African American kids at the Cleveland Museum of Art. They didn't know where India was. And for the six weeks, we worked on the collection. At the end of six weeks, they not only were absolutely enthralled with the sculptures, they felt like they were their friends, including dancing Shiva. So I also know the power of what it can do to connect people. And at the same time, I understand the issues of patrimony. So how to balance those two, which is the unique power of art, I think needs discussion. Otherwise, we get into this kind of very a facile restitution question that doesn't take account of the power that the art can have. So let me stop there. Thank you. Yeah. There's a hand back there. I, 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 I'll come to you, but that young person right there. Yeah, you had a hand. Just wait. Yeah. And then we'll stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really quite fascinating. I could have just listened to it for another hour or so, or maybe <laughs> several hours. Um, now that you showed us the painting of Jahangir and with a little Madonna, which I couldn't really see from here, um, what do you think of that painting at the National Museum where Jahangir is holding the Madonna's you know, picture in his hand? That's one question. Right. The other question is the painting of Dara Shiko, the wedding of Dara Shiko, where we see the girl's side, all women right. receiving him, but they don't really look you know, particularly Muslim or anything. Right. In fact, Dara got married to his cousin Nadira Begum. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there are two different questions. But I think that the first question of the Jangi looking at that picture has a lot to do with the fact that it, around this time, Sir Thomas Rowe is coming from England and all these Christian Jesuit figures are coming from the south, from Cochin, from Goa, with ivory, with pictures. And in fact, we know that Sir Thomas Rowe writes back to England saying, please don't give me junk because this emperor is very sensitive. He knows what is good. And if you want to get a privileged position in Surat, I need to get better things as gifts. So looking at it is actually Jahangir getting that gift from these Westerners who are occurring favors to look at that picture, and he's fascinated by it. But it's just he's fascinated by turkeys, the, you know, fowl, the foreign animals that come in. It's sort of like that. It's curiosity, you know, cabinet of wonders or something like that. And the Darashiko wedding, I think that's very interesting because by the time that wedding occurs, the wedding traditions are getting intermixed. And you have had many, many Rajput princesses who have come into the Mughal court. Weddings are happening in the Indian tradition. So it becomes a kind of an Indic wedding rather than a purely Muslim or a purely Hindu wedding. The ceremony might be different, but the functions are not so same. Yeah. yeah you, you had a hand. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
गुड इवनिंग मैम मैम माई क्वेश्चन विज रिलेटेड टू दैट पर्टिकुलर पेंटिंग ऑफ जहांगीर्स बर्थ विच इज़ इन जहांगीर नामा सो मैम वी हैव रेड दैट इन द मुगल पेंटिंग ट्रेडिशन देर आर टाइम्स मैन द फेसिस ऑफ द एरिस्टोक्रेटिक वीमेन आर नॉट शोन इन द पेंटिंग्स एंड देन देर आर सर्टन पेंटिंग्स वेर वी सी द फेसिस लाइक इन दिस पेंटिंग the queen the uh, who is the mother of the air her face is shown so right. does this tell us something about the changing social roles of women throughout the mughal empire well the truth of the matter is that women are shown all the time sometimes they're generalized but it's an idealized but doesn't mean that they're not shown and actually we also have a reference of female painters doing female painting So in the zanana it's possible that there were other groups of painters and we don't know enough about it but when it comes to things like jahangir nama which is a whole manuscript and if there is a birth of the emperor you got to show it but the face is not specified so the difference is that it's not a portrait the way the portraits of the emperor and the courtiers that i was showing you are there it much more idealized and generalized but it's not because they're not interested in the women but also because male painters didn't have access to the females uh, generally but there are these rare paintings there's a painting at the bharat kala bhavan that i showed in the exhibition in 85 and that is a woman painting a woman princess and so we know that that existed but we don't have enough evidence this yeah sorry yeah last question yeah. this would be the last question then yeah many times it is reported that plagiarism is happening of this type of painting so do you have any anything to say you mean copying of the um, yeah plagiarism pictures. yeah yeah, yeah. Fake um i think that there are lots of fakes that are out there and if there is a market there will be fakes and that's the truth and i i have to say that um it was a while ago that there was an exhibition that asia society did I, before i was there it was called the real the fake and the masterpiece and i was asked to write one of the essays and i actually showed a picture that was a very beautiful woman in aika and somebody showed it to me bikaner style very much like a ruknuddin picture and they told me it's 18th century picture beautiful and i said you know i want to meet the painter who did this <laughs> and they said what do you mean i said no no i really do because it's such a good painting and i really want to meet this person said ha kya bol rahe aap <laughs> so i actually met him and i said congratulations you've done a really good job the only problem is that don't sell it as a fake just sell it as your name you you're a good artist you know and they were like oh, oh, oh okay okay i mean because i was at the museum and they thought they could sell me the picture i bought the painting i said but not as an 18th century painting i'll pay i buy it for myself and so i think that what it does mean is that there is people with huge talents it's just that we have not supported them to the level whereby they could create their own version and not have to just make fakes but i i do think it's a market thing there are fake sculptures there are fake rembrandts there's fake indian paintings yeah thank you thank you vishaka ji may i request member secretary dr misra to uh, please present a small token of appreciation to uh, dr desai he wants the photo of the front of the uh, <laughs> 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 
Dr. Desai, the entire Intact family joins me in expressing our thanks and appreciation to you for scheduling this for us today. She arrived from US on 5th, late on 5th, and she's jet lagged and fatigued, but uh, still pushed through, and she's here with us today. And I will just um, sum up this uh, phenomenal, phenomenal um, lecture by saying that the ancient Sanskrit phrase Vasudhai Kutumbakam, which means treating the world as family is ubiquitous on the Indian landscape and the old age-old wisdom has permeated Indian culture from probably the beginning of the time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, join us for a cup of tea outside.